On this episode, the incredible Timothy Ferris stops by. This is Gary Vay Nurchuk, and this is episode 271 of the Ask Gary V Show. And I've got to be honest, thank God we finally did it because now I don't have to answer, oh, I don't know, 400 fucking times a week. <laughs> when am I going to have Tim on the Ask Gary V Show? I, I like literally needed to create some AI machine learning autoresponder. Uh, this is a huge honor for me. No question, one of the people that I admire the most in, let's call it the ecosystem, people putting out content, people trying to impact the world, people that are navigating through the game. And, uh, and so I am awfully excited for this episode and I know a lot of you just got super fired up as well. Uh, and uh, even more exciting, uh, Tim has a new book coming out in eight days um, and, uh, and we're gonna talk about that, we're gonna talk about uh, pop culture, business hacking, but Tim, for the nine people that are watching this <laughs> that don't know who you are, can you, uh, can you give a quick little bio? And before that, yeah. your new facial ha- hair game <laughs> is so legit. Inspired by kung fu movies. I, I figured. <laughs> yeah. I know your love for uh, Japan and all those Slash things. Slash down and, and out in Beverly Hills. No, seriously, it's uh, really like. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I figure I can't do it on fit, the top. Man. You've I'm feeling good. <laughs> yeah. So You've I'm going great. Jason Statham upside down face. I'm look, growing it this way. You do look fit too. Like, like thank you. you. Have you been like, ha- you had a good six months to you? I feel like the last time Gymnastics, I saw Gymnastics, fasting. I fast. Of, How, what's your fast game? Fast game is number Once. one. Don't do this at home, kids. Talk to your professional liability, cover my ass. Okay, so <laughs> three contiguous days each month. So I do a three-day fast every month, and then I do longer five to ten-day fasts two or three times a year. Uh, that kills my once a week. For that, well, no, but once a week. It's actually, it's debatable which is of greater benefit, right? The sort of high frequency, oh, the good news low is dose. I, th- it's so funny. when you you know Obviously, you get brought up a lot to me, and I'm like, look, anytime I want to do something... Like I intuitively do stuff, yeah. you do them for like you do like you re like look at this book like this, this is he goes thick like I was saying the girth of his work is so incredible the podcast the, the those blog. are the two pull quotes right there um, but it's so funny like I I I just fast once a week when I'm in that zone yeah. randomly because yeah. I just like the way I feel I yeah. have no idea of the data and the science and the understanding I know that's yeah. where your strength lies so there is no I'm, I'm trying to up my intuition game but for, are you but yeah yeah so we can talk oh, we about gotta, that we but, talk but about for that. the, for the I thought you were going to say for the nine people who, who are familiar with my work which may yeah, be true I love <laughs> depends when, on when I you're love, watching I love when Timmy goes <laughs> oh excuse me I love when Timothy oh yes thank you, thank uh, you thank which you. we have to talk about as well goes with the humility card Tim honestly You've you've had a it's been an unbelievable decade for you. You have yeah, not only crazy. a lot of you know awareness and people know who you are, yeah. but what I think is super interesting because there's a lot of names that run around the world. I there's two things that I really like about you from afar. Mm-hmm. From afar. One, a lot of people know who you are and as people get closer to actually you, the admiration grows, not declines. Thank and you. I think that is a big fucking deal. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so so where were we? Uh, hmm. The nine people. Oh yeah, so uh, I I suppose was put on the map as far as most people are concerned with a book called The Four Hour Work Week, which we could certainly talk about. Had its tenth anniversary the day I stepped on the TED stage this past year, Great April twenty fourth, to talk about the darkness. So the juxtaposition was quite. Interesting. Uh, and then after that, wrote a number of different books with the four-hour infomercially sounding vibe, and uh, then Tools of Titans, and then Tribe of Mentors. So I've retired the four-hour jersey for the time being. And uh, around ah, 2007, that of the time being, <laughs> I can't wait for that 20th anniversary four-hour four-hour Mars while we're all four-hour Mars. You know. Go Jeff ahead. Bezos with Tim Ferriss. <laughs> uh, and then uh, around 2007, also started angel investing and getting involved in yes. tech. And so the, the main financial impact piece on your career. of the pie chart has come from the involvement with tech. And I've done a lot of like, you know, TV projects and things of that nature. Yeah, TV, I, podcasts for the past few years, Tim yeah, Ferriss po- show. I mean, the podcast is a beast. Yeah, it's, it's, been, a good, it's been a good run. It's funny yeah. to believe that it started with me getting stupidly, inappropriately drunk, uh, 
out of nerves interviewing our friend Kevin Rose. I don't know why I was so nervous. <laughs> uh, but now, yeah, 300 or so episodes later, about 200 million, uh, more than 200 million downloads. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. So You did a really good job with that. Thank you. Okay, let's, get, let's go into this. What is the new book and what's it about? And then we'll bounce around. And don't forget, this is a call-in show. So Facebook, put in your phone numbers. This is a rare opportunity. Unlike me, who just weirdly adores interacting with people at all levels at all times. Tim, <laughs> I'm not speaking for him, but he's more limited than I am. Let's I'm put more, it this way. More so this, monkish in yeah, my behavior. So, so this is a rare opportunity. You can randomly DM me and I might just like probably respond. You know, Tim, like it, I can't get to him, yeah. you know, and so uh, I think that this is a huge opportunity. Make sure you call in. I would, I would recommend this be Tim questions. I'll get to you another time, but thrilled if we can where, where, wherever we cross paths. Uh, Talk to me about the new book. Yeah, so Tribe of Mentors came about. I just turned 40 not too long ago. And uh, it's been a big 12 months. It's been a heavy 12 months, too. I had a number of close friends die unexpectedly, including one of my mentors in this book actually passed away just a few weeks ago, very unexpectedly, Who's of that complications. Thing? Terry Lachlan, who taught me I'm how to sorry. swim. And, how old uh, was Terry? 66. So he had uh, metastatic or metastasized prostate cancer and then had complications from that and a stroke. And, I'm sorry. Uh, it's been, uh, thank you, uh, a good opportunity for me to just take a step back and say, all right, let me hit pause for a period of time to try to reassess priorities, look at the direction that I'm heading, look at the things I'm doing or not doing, how has planning or over planning or under planning helped or hurt me? How am I relating to myself, not just to the world? I mean, all these questions started to bubble to the surface. And it seemed like a good opportunity to ask a lot of questions, some of which are really tactical, some of which are more strategic, some of which are really high level life mission type goals. And uh, I asked myself the question, which I've been trying to do in the last couple of years, which is what would this look like or what might it look like if it were easy, right? So hmm. if, if this were simple, what would the structure look like? And I journaled on it, and the answer that came back was, you should just ask other people the questions that you are having trouble answering for yourself. So I reached out to about 140 people across every possible discipline, so ranging from, say, David Lynch, uh, the director, or Terry Crews, all the way to Kelly Slater, most decorated <laughs> surfer of all time, to Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's an incredible uh, writer, thinker, activist, Temple Grandin, I mean, you name it. Basically, every possible discipline and industry, artists, I reached out to all of them, people at the top of their fields, and asked them a set of 11 questions, and then compiled it into this book, Tribe of Mentors, because uh, I've thought for a very long time, and this is borrowing from somebody else, advice I got when I was probably 14 or 15, Who gave which was, uh, it was a, it was a, uh, <laughs> He was an older student in a martial arts class. He was an adult. And he left a voicemail on my answering machine. Remember those? Oh, that's cool. And uh, uh, by the way, guys, not on your mobile device. This yeah. was a machine with that physical was tape. To, physical tape. You have to put the tape in. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and if you ran out of tape, no more messages. <laughs> uh, but his message was advice to me, which was you're the average of the five people you associate with mm. most, which I still think physically, mm. emotionally, financially, mm. that's true. And I get asked all the time, well, what if I don't have five people around me that I can use to average up? And find them? Yeah, you find them, or you can do it remotely. You can do yeah. it virtually through audio, through video, yeah. through books. And so Tribe of Mentors was intended to give people 130 of the world's best to learn from. I love it. Yeah. What, uh, what stood out for you? So you sent this out to people. Mm -hmm. Stuff comes back. Yeah. You know some of these people really well, some people medium well. Some people not at all. Some people not at yeah, all. Just DM through Twitter, like. Love it. So what? Hail Mary. Were, they must have been pumped getting that DM. <laughs> uh, what did you? What did you kind of give me? A, give me one to three kind of like. This person said this, or I yeah. couldn't believe how well I knew this person and the thing they said. Like, give me a standout. Yeah, well, I'll give you a, a few. So Please. I'll give you. I'll give you two patterns. Uh, the first would be. I'd say 85 to 90% of all the people in this book, many of which I'd never had any contact with, have some type of very specific morning ritual, mm. uh, very often with some type of meditation or repetitive exercise, mm. which I think serve, in some cases, the same purpose. Mm. Uh, so very high percentage of people practicing transcendental meditation or Vipassana meditation specifically. Then uh, another pattern 
I think partially because of the question that I ask, which is, do you have a favorite failure? Or if you had to pick a failure of yours that set you up for a later success, could you tell a story? And for every huge success that you associate with someone, they have an equally devastating <laughs> loss that maybe hasn't gotten as much airtime or any airtime. So showcasing those is really important just because uh, when people are going through hard times or dark times, it's very easy to look at say, the magazine covers and think that, mm -hmm. well, Tim Ferriss has got it all figured out or, mm -hmm. or Gary's got it all figured mm -hmm. out and they never make mistakes. They never whiff a ball. And it's just, at least in my case, certainly not true. And I think it's important to showcase those. A few very specific pieces of advice that I've been using a lot recently. So number one, uh, you can't do all profound, deep questions or it gets really <laughs> tiring. It's just the heavy lifting. It's a lot of digestion. So one of the questions that I asked everybody was, what is the purchase of $100 or less that has most changed your life in the last few years? And one that came back was this supplement called Host Defense, My Community. It's a combination of different mushrooms that this chef, like a big time chef, has used for immune support when she's traveling. And so I started taking that. And it's like all the usual flu season cold stuff just gone. Uh, so from just a functional day-to-day -day perspective, I'm, Love you know, it. right now I'm like hustling, hustling, hitting it. And I've blocked <laughs> out time and that is, that travels with me. Right. So that's, that's one. Another would be, and I don't know if you've ever had any interaction with uh, Kyle Maynard, Kyle Maynard's fascinating guy. He's, a, he was born a, a congenital quad amputee. So he has his arms and before the elbows and mm -hmm. his legs before the knees. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, he is in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, like collegiate wrestling, and is the first person to ever climb Mount Kilimanjaro without prosthetics. So he military crawled the entire mountain. <laughs> He's such a stud. And he was taught by a CEO at one point. The CEO used this for hiring, but you can use it for anything. This particular CEO, very successful, would have his current employees rank prospective employees from one to 10. And that's not interesting by itself. His rule was you can't use seven. So I want you to rank him from one to 10. You can't answer seven. And what, what ends up being so beautiful about that and leveraged is that seven is a safe number. It's kind of like the non-offensive Switzerland of answers. It's not committal. It's not too bad. So you can wiggle out of it. Whereas if you're choosing a six, that's barely passing. That's not good. If it's an eight, you're into getting, you're pretty stoked. Like you're vouching. He forced them to make a decision. Exactly. So you can, I love it. one to 10, no seven. And uh, so I've know. used that and uh, Kyle has used it for say, invitations Just decisions, right? for anything, right. invitation to conferences, uh, invitations to coffee, whatever it might be. It's like decisions right, in life, decisions in life. So I, I, I've been using yeah. binary a lot lately, like yeah. black and white, one and zero. Yeah. And like, to me, that's the ultimate, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a yes, no game. But that's really the same thing as the seven in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah, exactly. Or with the, with the reality that there's a little yeah. massaging to all. Of oh, totally. Or yeah. or that's interesting. It, I like that a lot. Yeah, and uh, so another question that I asked everybody is, uh, what tips or, or suggestions do you have for saying no to <laughs> two different things, and or what and what have you gotten better at saying no to? And so we had, I mean, a lot of founders, a lot of people you would know in here as well. I mean, the founders of Facebook, Twitter, Salesforce, Craigslist, everything. Uh, Pinterest and so on. And Dustin Moskovitz, mm -hmm. co-founder of Facebook, was talking about no and the first no being the cleanest and the easiest. So what a lot of people tend to do is they 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 cross their fingers and hope something will go away. And they'll say, well, pay me in two months. Like I'm, I'm a little busy right now. I'm overcommitted, but That's maybe in three months. And then lo and behold, that, that person, move. if they know what they're doing, is they calendar it. And two months later, hello, hello, Gary. <laughs> it's been two time. months. That's right. And then you end up in this vicious cycle so of he's just hunting. Saying, so he's saying clean nose. He's no. providing, yeah, he's providing That's guidelines true. for clean first nose. No question in the last three years of my life, and especially even last year in running VaynerMedia, more radical candor, less honey massaging yeah. has helped. And it's so not natural to me. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I, I don't think it comes naturally to many people. Yeah. Especially if you, and uh, I mean, I know of some of your early story, certainly in my early story, for instance, of working in restaurants and so on. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. client facing, yeah. right? You, it's a high touch yeah. business and uh, you need to honey coat and know how to deliver things. And That's so right. to switch gears then is tough. 
it's tough, but when you get to a certain, if you even have a small amount of success in any field, if you want to 10x that and then 10x that and then 10x that, the behaviors that got you to the first point are very rarely 100%. the behaviors that get you to and, the next. And you know what helped me? I realized I wasn't doing any favors. No, 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 that, no. You know, to me before it was, I was doing something nice. Yeah. And you, you kind of through experience, you're like, wait a minute, I'm not doing anything nice here. No, no, By no. saying another two months. You're saving them short term pain to guarantee and, and, larger and, pain later. Sometimes. And I, and I still yeah. punt stuff for two months because sometimes I'm like, okay, in February, I like, I do still aspire to yeah. sneak something silly in. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, if you have like the seed of an interest in it. Yeah. Right? But there's, I think in many I cases, that's right. for a lot of folks, it's just like, oh God, I don't want to deal with this. All right, like let's hope it goes away. Listen, Punt. a lot of a lot of people in my audience already know who you are and are going to see you in other places or your own platform and are going to get this book. My world's been interesting in the last year, and I think there's a lot of people who, like, I actually for the not you know it's funny for the last seven or eight years I would have said nine people in our crossover. Mm -hmm. Now I think there's some more that are like, yeah, I've heard but haven't dug deep. What else can we say about this book? Because I do want everybody in this audience, and let's link it up, guys and girls. Because uh, I. I the work you put out is so real. I mean, I'm, I live, we live similar-ish, but different yeah. lives. We know what's going on yeah, out yeah. there. I'm just such a fan of the quality Thank and you. quantity. Yeah. I think, honestly, I think that's, we have a lot of differences, but I think one of our weird similarities is yeah. we've both been around for a little while now. Yeah. We've put out a lot of shit. Yeah. And somehow, miraculously, they're still somewhat interested. Yeah. And yeah, I think that totally. speaks to depth. And I think you have it. So what else should they know about the book or what else do we want to get off here until I yeah. ask you a little more about you as a whole and we're going to take the first call Oh yeah, in a yeah, second. Yeah, we can jump into all, all sorts of stuff. But I, I would say that whenever I write a book, and this is something I admire about you and actually I, I favorited and retweeted something recently. You may, may or may not have seen it on the first three minutes of your answer exactly. about yeah, what advice you would give to say someone just getting started going out into the world. And it was work for free for someone at as high level as possible uh, in basically an apprenticeship role. And the, I like literally believe yeah. that it, like if somebody texted me, I apologize cutting no, you off. You're fine. If somebody texted me right now and said, Hey, I'm getting to work for Tim for the next two years uh, and I can afford to, whether that means your parents put you in a position where you can afford to, yeah. you've made some money on eBay in your teens or Fuck it! I'm gonna live with 13 roommates in Oakland, in the outskirts of Oakland, and commute in to yeah. San Francisco. It's such a, it's a glorious win. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and you end up focusing on the the learning instead of earning. And the reason I brought that up is that I think you've been very good at making decisions, and I've tried to do the same, where you're developing skills and relationships, even if that project fails. Correct. And so it does not really matter if two out of 10 fail or five out of 10 or nine out of 10, if you are at like a snowball acquiring these skills and relationships, you're going to win. Like inevitably, if you just stick with it, you will win. And with, with the book, any book that I put out, the goal is for it to be more valuable years from now, even than it is today. And the reason, the reason I say that it's intended to be evergreen. So you have the really, really specific tactical stuff, but also the principles and the portfolio mm -hmm. of tools like the one to 10, but no seven, these types of tricks, if you Try will, that are just going to work. And they'll work 10 years from now, they'll work 20 years from now. So it's intended to be more like a choose your own adventure book where you can flip open to a single recipe. You're like, all right, I need to become stronger in X, Y, and Z way. Therefore, I'm going to look up, you know, Jocko Willink. Like, well, he's awesome. <laughs> he's, he's amazing. Yeah. Retired Navy SEAL commander. Or I want to become more focused on absorbing knowledge. Okay, I'm going to read, say, you've all know Harari's profile. He wrote Sapiens. has an incredible, incredible annual routine. It's, it's sort of rituals. Uh, so he inspired me to do my first uh, Vipassana meditation retreat, which I did not too long ago and has been hugely, hugely impactful. So it's, it's intended to be something that can be used immediately. So you pick something up, have a cup of coffee, and you can take something from it, but also something you can refer to for 10 years. I love it. Uh, but that's, that's, yeah, that's it. Let's take our first call. We should be uh, remiss, but I want to give a huge shout out to Kevin Rose, our mutual friend, for having uh, their first child, which is yes. Daria. Great job, Daria. It's amazing. Kev, Kev, Dardar. Love you guys. Hello. Who, what's the name again? Nicole. Nicole, hey, it's Gary Vaynerchuk, and you're on the Ask Gary V Show with Tim Ferriss. <laughs> oh my God, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> That's a, well, 
Take your mind back real quick, ask the question, then you can throw your mind out again. Sure, absolutely. So, my boyfriend's sitting next to me and he's freaking out too. Um, <laughs> what's his name? Jeremy. Jeremy, what's up? <laughs> Yo, what's up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, what's the question? So, my question is, a few months ago, I, um, I actually quit my corporate job because I was just not happy there. Started a VA company. And within two months, replaced my corporate salary and wow. am doing really well. I'm billing out like eight hours a day and working on weekends. And now I'm looking to scale my business and hire on maybe my own assistant or subcontractors underneath me. And mm-hmm. I'm just trying to figure out how to do that, maintain you know the expected level of quality that I put out, yep. and also enhance the positive relationships with my clients because... Yep. They do put a lot of value in me and trust. I mean, I have access to email accounts, social media accounts, credit cards, everything. And I just want to kind of keep that same level of quality and grow my business because, I, you know, I want to be more successful and, and, and grow. I totally understand. And, you know, I get it. It's a, and it's a non-scalable thing. And so, especially when you get into credit cards and social security numbers, the advice that I usually love, that's mine, and I, I, I don't think it's everybody's, but I'm a big fan of hiring intuitively to the best of your ability, but firing quicker if you know that it's wrong. There's a little extra dynamic there with things like sensitive information because you don't want to create the vulnerability that could be an atomic bomb. Is that, is, does that make sense? Is that something that's running through your mind? Yeah, no, absolutely. And some of the contracts that I have with my clients actually state like not hiring subcontractors. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to introduce that to my clients in a very respectful way to see if maybe we can, you know, talk about that in the future. Yep. Timmy. So I'm trying to just kind of like plan out how how I understand. I I got some thoughts. I'm going to let Tim jump in. Yeah, I I have a few. I have a, a few thoughts just because I spent so much time with one foot in the VA world. I would say that. uh there's a book called The E-Myth Revisited. I would take a look at that just in terms of systematizing how you train. And uh, just for the big picture and longer term view, I think that would be useful. There's also a book called Built to Sell that will allow you to think about building a business that is not dependent on you as a bottleneck. Uh, even if you never sell the business, it's a useful uh, set of check boxes. And just on the simplest level, I would say uh, you need to run background checks. <laughs> Certainly on, on, on people, it's a very simple, simple process, but uh, as, a, as a baseline, before you even consider someone, you should run base, uh, background checks. And then there, there are two components, I would say, for training and quality assurance to ensure that you're not doing it in a one-off fashion where you have to continually say the same thing is create various uh, documents and videos that can be used to train other people. So if you have a particular way of, say, parsing email, going through someone's inbox, determining what's important and what isn't, consider using a program like ScreenFlow, where you can capture all of that and walk someone through in real time how you are, say, clearing, categorizing someone's inbox. And then that video can in turn be used to train 100 people, ultimately, if it came down to it. And then last, just I'll, I'll try to keep this short. But no, this is a domain that you like. Yeah. Built. I mean, this is your, your most qualified I've, answer here. I've so seen ahead. companies built and self-destruct uh, in this space uh, quite a few times. Because a lot of them popped up after a four-hour work week. A I lot assume, of them right? popped up. And or, they all pinged you. Yeah, or I gave them the hug of death by promoting them and then they couldn't maintain the quality. They, they tried right? to scale yeah. too quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, 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 secret, the secret to scaling effectively, I think in a business like this is to scale very, very slowly in the beginning and uh, do not be in a rush to hand your clients off to someone else. What I would encourage you to do, and I've, I've seen this done elsewhere, is bring someone in on say calls, even if you don't do calls, consider incorporating them in a temporary way so that uh, they can handle low level, low sensitivity tasks for someone else and prove to be very fast and very, very reliable. And then as the trust develops between the client and this supplemental VA, uh, you can talk to the client about having them handle more in the interest of having better response time and higher quality. Um, so that, that would be, that would be uh, one approach. And last but not least, this is what I'll close with, I would at least every six to 12 months schedule a day where you can do a 30,000 foot review and ask yourself, 
do I want to scale? If the answer is yes, why do I want to scale? Because I see very often when people create, say, a business to manifest a better life for themselves that differs from, say, your corporate job, that they take something that's really going well and then recreate the problems that they experienced in their old job by creating complexity and trying to scale even if their lifestyle needs are already met with the income that they're generating. Yeah, the AKA, you're making 337 a year income from crushing it on something and now that's like the perfect zone and now you're making 509 but you hate your life yeah. and that extra sure. really meant nothing. Can I, can, how long, how long is, uh, you said two months in you were able to do that. How old is it now, the company? Um, about four months old. Right, and how old are you? I'm 35. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you know, I don't know if you watch any of my stuff, but obviously, if you're watching this, unless I don't think Tim we shared it, it. So, good. So, <laughs> patience, like, what, like, do not be in a rush. Like, like, I turn 42 tomorrow, right? And I feel 24, and that's the real truth. And and if you understood that and said to yourself, well, wait a minute, I'm going to feel exactly the way I feel now in seven years, it may not make you rush to scale. Yep. sooner than you needed to, I mean, you're four months in. Yep. Like, I, I'm almost, yeah, no, I'm you know. Not, I'm not looking to scale in, like, super quick, um, but just a little background story, and I, my Go husband's probably going to kill me for telling you guys Go this, ahead. but about a year ago, he had heart failure in the middle of the night, and after CPR and a coma and everything, it just kind of put things into perspective of, yes. I don't want to work 40 uh, hours for a company where I hate every second of every day. That's right. So, I, like, I decided that I wanted to work from home and that he and I could be together more and it. travel more. And, I love it. And so now that can I've replaced it, can, my corporate salary, it's great, but I want to have a little bit more free time, I guess, to, <laughs> to do that so look, stuff with look, him. So there, look, there's no such thing as free time or passive income when you own something because it's mental time. Like you, right. just, you have to wrap your head, you're gonna have to wrap your head around mental time versus physical time. I am so fired up for next week because somewhere around Tuesday morning, I know the world shuts off, at least in America, let me rephrase, the US shuts off somewhere around Tuesday morning because first everyone's gonna buy Tim's book, but second of all, because <laughs> it means that Thanksgiving <laughs> is about to start and I know Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday are literally the best days of the year for me Literally, this is not a joke. Next week, Tuesday afternoon, my team will feel it. I am in the best mood because it is literally one of the 24 days a year where I can actually mentally relax a little bit because the world shuts down for, I'm sorry, the US shuts down for Thanksgiving. That will happen again during the Christmas week. That will happen in this miraculous new one that is new in the last eight to nine days of August, which was a European thing but has now become an American thing. You just need to travel more, spend more time together. That could be physical, but when you guys are seeing the Eiffel Tower, or when you're having the best sushi ever in Japan, or when you're watching a, you know, a great soccer match in Spain, your mind's gonna be on this business some way, somehow, no matter how zend out, how much meditation. When you make that leap to being the final line of defense, there is a truth in that that is something you're gonna have to wrap your head around and no level of scale is gonna change that. It will only increase it. Yeah, and I, I would yeah, add, it, if, if I may add one, uh, one more thing. No, you're good. Let me just add one more thing. So, be, so because Gary's mentioning some potential peak life experiences that you could have, which may be part of the impetus or dream related to building this business, I would say a year from now, try to schedule four or more weeks where you are not part of the system. And in other words, if you schedule at least four weeks, it has to be at least four weeks, off the grid where other people are making decisions for your business, what that means is prior to leaving on that vacation to Spain or wherever it might be, you have to put systems in place, rules, policies, people, et cetera, that will allow you to do that without everything falling apart. And those systems then outlive the vacation and you come back 100%. and that helps you then to scale because you've proven that you are not the bottleneck for every and all decisions. But you have to force that. If you just say, I'm going to make an effort to build it, that's generally not gonna be enough. But if you've pre-committed to yourself and your boyfriend, maybe even other people in your family, you've bought plane tickets, 
Now you have accountability. Uh, and, and that's very, very, I've seen it be very helpful for entrepreneurs who want to scale, but not to do so by and, bleeding out their eyeballs. And let, now that we're just going high level, we're just really jamming here and playing a little ping pong. Let, let me talk about accountability. You know, buying plane tickets may be accountability for a big percentage of people because it's a financial one. Yep. It took me realizing at 38 years old that I'm only accountable to other human beings, yeah. not money, and that's how I hacked my health finally. I hired a full-time health employee, and I didn't want to let Mike and now Jordan down, so I wasn't competing with myself or letting myself down. That's why I wasn't winning that game. But yep. once I realized my accountability was actually other human beings, totally. Totally. That's how I hacked that. So yeah. get make sure Tim's right, but then make sure it's not money because you might be like, screw it. Who cares about the two thousand yeah. no, dollars of no, plane the, flights? The people are really important. Yeah. I mean, this is part of the reason. Before we started recording, I was saying that uh, you know, after reading an article called "The Tail End" by Tim Urban, "Wait But Why," which had a huge impact on me, how I related to my family, and realizing that you know by the time I think you graduate from high school, you've spent eighty percent of the total hours you will ever ever spend with your parents before they die. I started scheduling every six months a trip with my family. Now I'm taking my family on this trip, but it's also extremely beneficial to me because I'm taking in this extended trip every six months and I have to ensure systems are in place. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's a fantastic way to raise other people up while also improving your business game at the same time. I love it. I hope that I helps. I love it too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Fortunately, my boyfriend is just as entrepreneurial as I am, so... We love this stuff. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great day. Love you guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Let's get another call in. You know, it's super interesting. I mean, like, you know, the, the reality is, is that restrictions, Snapchat, creating a restriction to the openness of social at the time had the real upside. I think in life, those restrictions are a huge deal as well. Oh, huge, huge, And I, I think people huge. aren't putting those barriers there. And the reason I got so excited when you said buy the plane tickets it, you know, I didn't realize that money wasn't my barrier anymore. Yeah. And and I've had different levels of money. It was ne I was never trading on money. Yeah, yeah. And so once I figured myself out, I'm like, ooh, I I'm a good CEO because I don't like to let people down. Yeah. I work for them, not them me. Yeah. And and that's how I've been able to hack. And I think it's super important for people to get inside themselves to totally. understand those things. Oh, totally. Who's this? Charlie. Charlie. Charlie speaking. Charlie, this is Gary Vee. You're on the Ask Gary Vee Show with Tim Ferriss. My man, Gary, what's up, Brian? Uh, things are good, Charlie. How are you? <laughs> man, life is good. Good, man. What's your question? All right, I got, I got, uh, I need two answers from you guys. One from each of you. You got uh, it. How y'all run y'all's businesses? Real quick, you chopped off for a second, Charlie. One more time. I said, what have y'all learned from hip hop that has transformed how y'all run your businesses? I love it. Is that CEO Charlie? Charlie, I didn't, I didn't catch your name. I love it. I'm so glad you're on the call, man. How yeah, are you man. doing? Man, life is good. How's, Never been better. How's Titty Boy? Man, Titty Boy is doing amazing. Witness all around me like a pool. You say who? AKA two chains deal. for all of you guys that don't know. <laughs> Tim, what is your hip hop story, if at all? I actually not uh, sure I know. Yeah, you know, so uh, believe it or not, uh, I was one of the co-founders of the first hip hop dance troupe at Princeton University. And, I'm so excited and right now. So this is hip hop dance troupe, so b boying, and b girling, uh, is is my history primarily. So I was listening to you know at the time like Eric B and Rakim and so on. Of course, but uh, the dance troupe, which is still going strong now, I mean more than uh, more than two decades later. So I would say my what what I learned from hip hop is that you know there are certain at least within the dance forms that there are certain techniques and there's certain basic principles, let's say in top rocking and, and, uh, and footwork and power moves and all of that. So they're, they're basic ingredients, but beyond that, you have the power to improvise and that the, the rules are almost meant to be broken. Like if you look at, for instance, Korean b-boys and what they've done in the last 10 years, b-boy pocket, especially if people want to see power moves that'll blow their minds, uh, can keep redefining this genre that is still recognizable as hip hop. And that's part of what's so excite, exciting to me about it is that while you have this, this recognizability and pattern matching, you still as an individual have so much freedom to create. And that's true in business. That's true in how you decide to interact with your loved ones, whatever the rules of engagement might be there. And uh, so I think, it, I think it can be translated to almost every possible area, including, including business, where I make a point of breaking uh, my own rules repeatedly as experiments to see what happens. 
And I do that in terms of formats in the podcast. I do that in terms of how I communicate with my employees. So I, th I think it's very, very far ranging. Charlie, for me, the, and the, you know, I grew up in a culture in Edison, New Jersey that really embraced it. Like, you know, fifth grade for me was Adidas with no shoelaces. Like I was all about it. <laughs> and so, but here's what's interesting. Everybody told me, you know, our teachers told us in fifth grade in 85 that it's not music, right? Like it was obviously urban and minority. It wasn't, you know, like I, I grew up on MTV when Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson wasn't being played on MTV and like politics had to be played to have him on. So here's what I learned in the 25 years that I've paid attention to it close from afar, close from afar. If you're tried and true, the market will come to you. What is super yeah. interesting to me about hip hop is it is now a absolute fundamental pillar of our culture across all genres and it stayed true to itself. It evolved, but the world came to hip hop. Hip hop didn't go to the world. And, and then I mm -hmm. realized as I got older, oh, rock and roll did the same thing. And honestly, that's what happened with me in entrepreneurship. Unlike Timmy, who's incredibly good at girth and super <laughs> smart at things that I'm not, he was a really good student. And he'll tell you, he's, you're 40, Tim? Now? Yeah, 40. And I'm, I'm turned 42 tomorrow. I grew, we grew up in an era, Charlie, that a lot of these kids are not growing up in, which was entrepreneurship wasn't a thing. No. You were judged mm -hmm. by, I went to Mount Ida College, Tim went to Princeton, and that was the judge and the jury when we were 18, 19. Tim was a winner, I was a loser. And, and then to watch Tim break out of the model of what every Princeton kid did, went a very different path, and a lot of cynicism, I'm sure, from the bankers and all the other people oh, yeah. that he went to class with, and I'm sure there was plenty of jokes and, and cynicism behind his back, and now all of those people who are watching right now would a hell of a lot be more excited to be this path than the alternative. Hip hop, let the world come to it, and I think the biggest thing in business is you have a product or service that people don't see, and the other thing Tim and I share is we were there early for a lot of these products that nobody knew in the mass world, we knew in our little subculture, but people didn't know, like ordering an Uber seemed ridiculous, that's why I passed, Tim Smarter, you know, it's, it's you know, or Twitter, <laughs> luckier, luckier. or Twitter, or all these other things. <laughs> the world came, when Tim, did, listen, there was a lot of entrepreneurs, Patty Flynn, J JLD, Lewis House, but when Tim did his podcast, I don't know the timing of you and those three, but when Tim did his podcast, it was earlier, things had happened, he wasn't the first, but he was the biggest when he did it. And that was still you know, 24 months earlier than I did it or others did it. And he reaped the benefits of that, right? I've had those moments on, you know, on, on Snapchat or Instagram or things of that nature, like you know, YouTube for sure. By the way, fun fact, there's another video with Tim and I. We're much younger, we're drinking oh, yeah. wine and it's like eight years old. We may have to slice that into the oh, yeah. post-production. I had more hair. Yeah, me too. And so, um, you know, I think, I think that, um, t Charlie, my answer is, if you believe in your thing, stick with it, and the world will come to you. If you're passionate about cricket protein, this is not a joke, by the way, now. This is actually something I think is gonna work out. If you're passionate about cricket protein, bet the farm on it, because if you see it and you understand why you see it, it's gonna be a lot of fun in nine years when we're all eating it and you were mm -hmm. there, not because it's not selling right now. Most of the things that have brought good to Tim and I, because I can definitely speak for myself and I've watched from afar and sometimes close with Tim, people weren't super sure about at the time. We're playing on being historically correct. Hip hop was historically correct. Yeah. That's right. Appreciate it, Charlie. Right. Keep hustling, man. I'm impressed with you. I also love your health transformation, which has been epic. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome, brother. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Um, right? Yeah. I mean, for example, you experiment on yourself on all sorts. Like, you <laughs> are out there, like, taking all sorts of concoctions and doing mental stuff that, that I know, not for me, yeah. I won't do it because it's not natural for me, yeah. but I know you're going to be historically correct. Like, I watch it and I'm like, fuck, man, I wish I had that gear because he's going to, like, pee in 30 <laughs> years. People are like, fucking Ferris was doing that shit in 2007. You well, know that, right? No, well, I, a lot of it, I mean, if you look at For Our Body 2010, a lot of that is now proven out. I mean, the vast majority of the book, <laughs> so cool. uh, which is cool, but I would on. also say that Let him finish it uh, that if you look, whether it's hip hop or me doing all these weird experiments or you doing your thing, it's it's easier for us to 
indulge that obsession and to do that thing, no matter how weird it is, than to hold it inside. Right. So like, we don't, we don't have, we can't, we can't, we have no other option. No. Right. So it's, and it's like when you have that feeling, that's a really positive indicator in a lot of cases, right? Like people ask me, should I write a book? And I'm like, no, probably not. I mean, I, it's <laughs> in the sense that I write books because you have no I, choice. I, I have these things trapped in my head and I have to get them out or I'll drive myself crazy. Do you feel like you, I, a couple other people are empowering people to do that for their thing? I think so. Do you so. feel like you're a motivator to others to go tried and true because you're so deeply tried and true to your thing? I, I hope so because do I- you sp- Do you like that idea or is it, or is that doesn't come to your mind? I, I like the idea of showing people both the successes and the failures so they can see net net that yes. it's actually low risk. If that's that makes right. sense. Like, guess, like net net. If you're, <laughs> if you're developing skills and relationships and that's how you choose your projects and- you are not trying to appeal to the entire world. You're trying to find your 1,000 true fans who are just as crazy about cricket protein or whatever it might be as you are. Over time, you will make mistakes. You will have what people perceive as failures, but over time, you will win. It's just, it's almost an inevitability. And so if, if I can showcase that for people where they're like, oh, I saw Tim Ferriss publicly faceplant when he did A, B, and C and television, that didn't work out. I saw him try this new thing with this one book, that didn't work out. But still, like in between, he had this huge success and this huge success. You're talking about the Amazon thing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, really. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. listen, I mean, like, like, I mean, 90% of the stuff we do doesn't work. Yeah. Sid and I are supposed to have an international domination tour in 2017 of all my content being transcribed all over the place. He texted me three days ago. He's like, really hope that we can get focused on the international tour. It's fucking November. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you know, like, yeah. We're, we're losing all the time. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. Like if you get a few things right, you can screw up almost everything else. And one thing right sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes right? one thing right. And if it's big enough. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, um, you know, for that reason, uh, I don't, somebody asked me not too long ago if I, if I viewed myself as a role model, I wouldn't use that. I think I don't want people to try to be me. But if they can take lessons from watching my public successes and failures, and that gives them the courage to try something because they've now realized that it's in fact very low risk or reversible. Actually, before you go there, Tim, Great. self-esteem. Yeah. Something I've been talking about a lot over yeah. the last 18 months, more than ever before. Why do you think you had it? Mom, dad, environment, something I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm asking. I don't know. So, so this but, is. But you have it. You're talking right now, yeah. and I'm like, I connect with it tremendously because yeah. it is the drug. Yeah. It is the one that, like, you're right. Like, let me ask you. I'm going to ask a bunch of things because I'm going to get a yeah, yeah. doubt here. Do you like the failures more than the successes? No. Okay. I do. Yeah, yeah. Are you eating chocolate? I, I, I think. What is that? <laughs> It looks delicious. Uh, um, sorry. Arms I, reach. I keep, promised keep, I was going to, keep I could feel that I was, I felt that I was going to eat yeah, I, I guess no, it's like a you, blood I, I knew I could feel the chemicals <sighs> in my head. I'm like, I'm about to get radic- I'm about to get random. Cause I've been staying very calm for very long. I've been trying to keep this vibe and I'm like, yeah. I'm about to fucking explode. So, so real quick, but real quick, like, yeah. uh, so I really do. And I'm not kidding. I mean, look, yeah. Let me phrase, maybe I just like them the same. I definitely am not yeah. scared of them and I definitely like them a lot more than I think a lot of people. Yeah. Why do you have self-esteem, okay. do you think, from your standpoint? Yeah, so let me answer a few different things. Uh, not necessarily in, in that order, but I would say, so I, I hate, I greatly dislike <laughs> failure. Uh, I love being underestimated. Mm. So if someone says, oh, Tim Ferriss is trying X, He's never, that's never going to work. I'm I like, great. Then it's nothing but upside. Oh, I love it's it. already assumed that it's going to be a worst case scenario. It's, I have nothing but upside. I love that. Uh, How, as your brand has grown, as your successes have grown, do you, do you like trying to do new things because you're trying to scratch that itch? In part, definitely. Yeah, me too. Yeah, because if I'm doing the same thing, then it's like, it's kind of like being Serena Williams. It's like, oh yeah, no, like if you don't win Wimbledon, <laughs> we will be no, no, disappointed. The grand slam. Yeah, like you have to win everything <laughs> because we expect you to or we're going to be disappointed. So ridiculous. My God, yeah, what that's, a, well, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the self esteem bit, I'm going to answer, give you an answer that might surprise you. Uh, so I have spent, for a host of reasons that I don't necessarily want to get into right now, but some, some really like dark, bad stuff when I was a kid that, uh, I spent the most, the vast majority of my life disliking myself. Okay. And uh, that's something that I've tried to, I've realized is not an optional piece of the puzzle. Like you cannot love other people fully if you just tolerate yourself. 100%. 
And so if not for yourself, for other people, your family, your loved ones, you have to reconcile bits and pieces inside of you. And the reason I say that is the, I think what I could attribute my successes to is more the fact that I was confident I could train myself to absorb or tolerate very high levels of pain to outwork other people to win in sports like wrestling, which is all pain, right? And so I chose arenas in which I felt like even if I lacked the technical gifts, even if I lacked certain coaching advantages that I could still win because I could just outlast other people. And I enjoyed being uh, an instrument of competition. How much? And I still do. I mean, I love competing. I just, I lo- I'm better in competition than I am in, in rehearsal. I right? understand. Yeah, it's like, it's really how- weird, but that's just me. I, I, I how feed much off of time it. did you spend in your own head in your teenage years? A lot, because I was, I was horribly, I mean, you and I, I was, I, I've, I've known of your, some of your backstory and certainly, I mean, you're in, you're in this, right? And I'm talking about some of the bullying experiences and I was tiny kid until about yeah. sixth grade. I got my ass kicked. I mean, it was like Lord of the Flies every day. I mean, I had to race <laughs> my bike home so I wouldn't get the shit kicked out of me. Yeah. And uh, so that, I think, developed a lot of anger in me and I used that <laughs> as a fuel. I was I an angry kid. I was not, I mean, there were moments of happiness for sure. And I I had a good family life, but I was an angry kid. And so in high school, uh, I was very uh, solitary. I did not, I wasn't a social butterfly at all. Do you think you're social now? I think I'm an introvert who can pretend to be, not pretend to be an extrovert. I can, I'm an introvert. Yeah, I'm an introvert who, who recognizes the value of being extroverted for certain things. It's really interesting. I was like thinking- to teach, it's very difficult to teach. I view myself as a teacher, not a writer. It's very difficult to teach well if I'm overly introverted. Right. It's interesting. I was thinking about, uh, I knew we were going to hang today. I was just like, you know, you, you reverse engineer. And you're, I thought about all the time. I realized something very interesting. Out of the people I know, and we've gotten to spend some time together, it's interesting how much of our time together has been one-on-one. Yeah. In the 13, 11, 9, 16 times we've hung out, yep. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Why is 75% of that time in that coffee shop in San Francisco yeah. on the grassy knoll at South Park, oh, yeah, Southwest? Yeah. Like I was like, wow, we, you know, it was interesting to me. And I, I, it just made me think a little bit about that. Yeah, I don't do, I don't do terribly well in groups. I'm not, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't do well in big groups. Uh, but if, if I, for instance, if I do a book signing, I need two or three days to recover from that. It's, it's so depleting for me because I want to, I want to be on. It's not like, Oh great. Oh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Goodbye. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm so in it. I mean, I'm looking yeah. through somebody yeah. like into them, yeah. not just at them. Yeah, I get it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I need, I need a lot of solo time to recharge. I get it. Let's do one more question. Adam. Chips on shoulders, man. Yeah. There's such a fucking advantage. Jesus Christ. I like, you just, yeah. chips are good, boy. They're, chips they're, are good. They're, they're good until they're not. Yeah, of course. If yeah. you don't know how to control it, yeah. it gets real bad. Yeah. They go, they, you know, yeah. you and I could have been flip, real fucking, over. fucking <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I mean, we could have been known for way, way more stuff than that. Nope. Adam, it's Gary V. You're on the Ask Gary V. Show with two guys with <laughs> chips on their shoulder. Oh, my God. Um, a- hey, Gary. Hey, Tim. How hey, are hey. you? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm actually in class. I just walked out. <laughs> That's a very good strategy. <laughs> what, what, um, what can we help you with? Well, uh, I was like memorizing my questions. I can't remember what was it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. My question is uh, for a foreign student. Oh, no, foreign student. I'm sorry. I'm just like joking right now. No worries. We got you. We're not hanging up. Okay. So um, for someone like me who just traveled from Asia or Malaysia to uh, US and I'm 20 years old so I just started college and all that and I watch many of your videos about um, being learning to hustle and um, basically going into this um, entrepreneurial land like you said so where do I start I, I want to start doing things I want to start experiencing things but uh, you know, I don't know where to start. And so, so real quick, and, and this seems like this could get real good actually for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, Tim said something super interesting uh, earlier about should I write books? And he was like, no. 
And you know, I came out the gate with the hustle and the entrepreneur thing. You know, for our work, you crush it. You have these moments where like you've got a lot of more life to live to like reconcile those those headlines that people put you into. Um, you know, I, you know. As I hear your question, and I've been doing a lot more of this over the last two years, which I think is a maturity of, that I'm happy with. Do you have to be an entrepreneur? You know, to me, I always think about the number eight at Facebook versus the number one of the nine million things that didn't work. You know, I want to make sure that I'm not inspiring something that sounds great but isn't really you, or do you feel like you are and maybe the culture you grew up with suppressed that in school? Like, what's your read right now at a young age? Do you, are you excited about that? Do you need it? Like, why are you gravitating? Because when I hear, how do I start an entrepreneur, I'm scared already because when you're a purebred, you don't, I mean, I don't know, fucking go buy something at the dollar store right now and post <laughs> it on Craigslist. I mean, you know, that right. feels very raw and real to me. The modern day entrepreneur of like making a deck and raising $4 million on an idea and this, that, that is student entrepreneurship. Sometimes not, but like, I'm curious where you are. Um, right now, obviously, I, um, I have no background experience in sales or being an entrepreneur. In, in fact, I just, recently um, has the, uh, not the urge, what's the word for it? It's like, I just wanted to be an entrepreneur because you, you really inspired me to be that. And I, I saw, uh, because my mom, she's in um, marketing sales, so it kind of picks off from there. And for now, I'm actually in um, liberal arts, which I'm actually planning to change to business, uh, international business uh, major. But that was another question that I was about to ask you if it's um, the right path, if I want to be an entrepreneur. I am very passionate to be an entrepreneur. Go ahead, okay, Adam, <laughs> let, let me jump in here for a second. Where, where do you live right now? Sorry? Where do you live right now? I, I'm living in uh, Rochester right now in Henrietta. All right. So uh, there, there are a few thoughts that I have for you. The, the first is that there are as many paths to entrepreneurship as there are entrepreneurs. There's no one right way. So the, the most important thing that I would want to convey first is that you're not going to make any fatal mistake at 20 that's going to prevent you from being an entrepreneur for the rest of your life. You could, you could have 20 failed businesses and then still go on to be a all billionaire time. all time, right? You could become whatever. You probably don't know Wayne Gretzky is, but the, the Wayne Gretzky and Mike Tyson, uh, maybe if you get that uh, of, of your chosen field. So I would say, number one, like don't be afraid of your first steps because there really isn't any clearly defined path. My recommendation at 20 would be to not try to memorize the entire playbook and start from scratch. What I would potentially consider is finding a small, fast-growing company nearby mm -hmm. and either interning or volunteering or doing something that allows you to be in any room with people who are negotiating and deal making because at the so end of the, at the end of the day it, like, just, it could it, yeah it could be real estate it could be design it could be web services it really doesn't matter what the industry is it's the skill set so you want to get very good at crafting deals and persuading and negotiating, and the easiest way to get good at that is to observe someone who is doing that uh, regularly, whether that's on the phone or otherwise. Uh, so, so I would suggest that you look for opportunities to learn from other people who are, who are already good at deal making and negotiating, because you will use that in everything, whether you're buying, selling, or anything in between. Uh, the just to answer your other question, and then we can we can hop around a little bit. Uh, well, first, actually, to identify your obsession if you want to do that. That could be part of your journey. Uh, there's a book mm -hmm. called Small Giants by Bo Bur Burlingham, which I would recommend checking out, which profiles a number of different businesses that are not intended to scale. Uh, so you might have a woman who makes you know, leather pants for the most famous rock musicians in the world, and she makes 100 of those a year, and she makes a few hundred thousand dollars, and she only accepts clients she loves, and that's it. That's, that's a real analogy you made that. That's real. That sounds cool. And uh, <laughs> like Cheryl Crow is like one of her, one of her, one of her clients. And uh, so that, that's one you can take a look at. And just to your question about college and majors, so I was a liberal arts major, and I was in neuroscience, that didn't work out. And then I went to East Asian studies and studied Japanese and Chinese. That has, from the outside looking in, nothing to do with <laughs> what I'm doing right now. However, I would say 
that it is very hard to learn business in a school setting. That's just, it's like learning how to play football by reading books about it and then trying to go to the Super Bowl. This does not tend to work out very well. Uh, so right. if, if you are going to stay in school, and you know, I'm of the mind that there is some value in that, depending on your circumstances, and certainly your parents would probably like that, uh, if I had to guess. So view college as a way to become a better rounded human being and also, if you are interested to develop certain skills, like I would, if, if, you were say, if you were to say to me, my passion is entrepreneurship 100%, that's all I want to do, I would probably tell you to take computer science and math classes before business. Because if you have those skills, you can figure out the businessy stuff in a three-day <laughs> tutorial from someone. Uh, so those are, those are a few thoughts, but just my perspective based on my life experiences. Brother, here's, let me tell you something. Entrepreneurship is tricky right now because it feels like anybody can do it. You don't see Steph Curry and at 20 and say, I'm inspired now, I'm gonna be an NBA player and think that that's tangible. Entrepreneurship has zero cost of entry. It's awfully cool right now. And you know, it's very scary for me. One of the things I'm trying to combat, Adam, is, is people jumping in because I'm an inspiring character, but it was what I always was and always will be. And so I think, I think that there's a lot there from Tim that's important. You can't, you can't, like, you can't think it's that easy to just be inspired and be successful at something. I would spend more time tasting. Yeah. I think you should try to do as many things as possible. And to Tim's credit and point, try to surround yourself. I would really pour on the extrovert nature. I'm empathetic immigrant in a new country or a foreign exchange or whatever you want to call it. So it might not come as natural to roll up on anybody. You might just be introverted by nature. But I would, I would take advantage. Well-rounded person in college, I get it. I know that's a narrative. To me, it's just take advantage of a captive group of people in the same place yeah. and try to meet as many people as possible. Entrepreneurship is hard. Being a successful entrepreneur is stunningly rare. Yeah. Way more than people think, right. Adam. So I think patience also, 20 years old. I mean, like, to Tim's point, the next 10 years you can taste fail. It's why I'm pushing people to get closer to big time mentors because what you will siphon out of them is gonna be so much more ROI positive. Don't put pressure on yourself to thinking it's either school or entrepreneurship. Yeah. There are so many twists and turns. Yeah, there's, 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 there is a lot on the spectrum, which is, you know, Gary, you and I, I think see this a lot in our respective audiences, which people where people make a false dichotomy out of full time employment or full time entrepreneurship. That's it. That's it. That's That's it. The, and no, there's actually a spectrum in between. So as a student, for instance, one thing that I did when I was in college, which you might consider, is becoming a a part or beginning a student club or a student union of Love some that. type. Love that. So that you have to sell membership. You have to Love actually that. take notes, keep uh, track of records, right? So if there's some, it right. doesn't matter what it is. Like if you are, say, the graphics editor of the school newspaper, you're going to have to learn how to deal with deadlines. You're going to have to learn how to maybe interact with ad sales because so-and-so is buying a two-page spread. And now you have to integrate and reflow the entire design of the magazine. These are all experiences that mimic the real world, uh, meaning non-school world. So I would encourage you to learn on someone else's dime, right? At school, you, you aren't necessarily paying a lot for your mistakes, which relates also to my recommendation to maybe work with a, within a smaller company where you have the opportunity to observe a really good deal maker, where you can make mistakes and someone else is paying for that education. Adam, do me a favor also. Buy something yep. on Craigslist or eBay or a store and resell it on the internet. Figure it out. I, I just go through the exercise. The exercise of buying something and selling it for a profit is an incredible, incredible indicator and, and exposes a lot in the game because it's always some level of buying and selling. Um, just do that. It's a very easy, fun or not fun venture and it will be quite telling in the success or non-success you have if you do it a couple of times. I'll give one more. Go ahead. Which is actually... Uh, so Adam, I don't know you, but I've spent a good amount of time in Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, so another mm -hmm. exercise I would suggest, because entrepreneurship, if you choose to take that route, is full of uncertainty. And yep. uh, what I would suggest, and also uh, nervousness in many cases. So when you, when you go out to get a cup of coffee or tea or whatever it is, and this is borrowed from a friend of mine named Noah Kagan, hmm. ask for 10% off. 
So like for the next 10 coffees that you get, That's each time you get to the head of the line, I don't care if it's Starbucks, it doesn't matter if they say yes or not, but ask for a 10% discount. You can't say you're doing an experiment. You can't say that Tim Ferriss told you so. You just have to ask for 10% off and just sit there and wait for them to respond. Did you do this, Tim? Yeah. And what were the conversions? Uh, well, it makes you more comfortable with discomfort. And you also realize the downside is so limited. The limited, the, the downside the, is you just- I respect the macro yeah. amazingness. No, no, no. What were the conversions? Oh, How the many, conversions? Yeah, how'd you do? Oh, the conversions are surprisingly high. Well, I yeah, mean, like 70%? Seven of the 10 people at a Starbucks or Pete's Coffee or some random place were like, okay, sir. Yeah, or, or they're just like so stunned <laughs> that they're like, wait, this is Starbucks. And I'm like, I know. I would still and? love, I would really appreciate 10% off. And like half the time there's like, <laughs> okay, okay, guy. Sure, yeah. I don't want, like. I don't. I don't want to fight this fight right now. So okay, fine. Ten percent off. Yeah, knock yourself out. I love it. And try some of those things. Get back to us, okay? All right. Thank uh, you very much. Good luck. Good luck. What else, Timmy? As we're wrapping up. What else? What else is going Any, on in your world? Else. Like, what's? How are your start? Your investment? Are you still investing? I haven't. I haven't really done any investment for about two years. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been I've, out for I've about stepped s- out. Me too. Yeah, no, it's it's. You just uh, think it's overpriced? It's hard to pick the winners as much. Yeah, it's, too much it's supply and demand. Too issues. much. Yeah. Too much supply in terms of cash and uh, too much. This is going to sound like a crotchety old man, but maybe that's me. Uh, a lot of also entitlement. Like, if my yeah. startup isn't valued at. You know, pre money thirty million because I had yeah. an idea while I was taking a dump ten yeah. minutes ago. Yeah. Then I'm insulted. It's like yeah. no, no, no. You have to earn that. Uh, and so I like to wait. I mean, uh, things go in cycles. I I will definitely be investing again, but I'll wait until there's blood in the streets. What about voice? That seems to me like the closest thing to social I've seen in a long time. I'm going to probably invest in that space. The yeah. platform building on top of Alexa and yeah. Google Home. I'm real bullish on it. Oh, I think I think it's going to be a super active space. I think yeah. it's probably also going to be a very crowded space. Yeah. Uh, just like, say, uh, blockchain and AI, uh, and, yeah, AI yeah, and all of that. All so the, the, when you move into a crowded space, you just have to make sure that you have an informational or analytical advantage so that you can pick reasonably intelligently. And at this point in time, I'm allocating my brain space to, you know, more of the writing and the podcast and so on. So that I don't have, I think a re I don't have enough bandwidth to do a financially responsible job. I, love I would just be spraying and praying or being like, Oh, my 10 friends are in. Okay, I fine. Yeah. I mean, which, we did a lot of that, back which I don't want to do because <laughs> all of my friends who have funds have too much money. So they're, <laughs> they're spending more money than I should I as an individual. So I, I would say, uh, uh, you just, just maybe to, as an overlay on everything we've been talking about that a lot of folks look at me and some people assume that I'm a risk taker. Oh, he's loves risk. He loves taking no risk, no reward and all this. I am so focused on risk mitigation at all me times, too. you know, and, me too. and, uh, because look what you, I did in the height of everything, yeah, when yeah. we were living it, I decided to build a client service business. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? No, I get it. <laughs> but I think that's in part because you and I have had so much practice capping the downside mm-hmm. and like walking through that rehearsal. Like, all right, can I, can I actually stomach and handle the worst case scenario? If so, all right, I'll cap my downside. And then eventually the upside will take care of itself. And you know, like you shared, um, uh, in, in a tribe mentors, this is another one I think about a lot, which is when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, you know, what do you think, what do you do or what do you think about? And your answer was, uh, you know, if you're going through something very difficult, you imagine your family dying in a terrible accident and it puts yeah. it in perspective. It's like, there are problems that we put in quotation marks and we make a big deal out of on a day-to-day basis. And then there are tragedies and crises and real Period. dark real things stuff. that can happen. And when you put it in perspective, you're like, Oh yeah. Like, right. Whatever. Getting my, my coffee Lost 20 that, minutes yeah. late and it's cold. Maybe not a big deal. Like yeah. maybe that should not occupy or any like of my mind. Big lost a huge account. Yeah. Lots lost of a huge account. dollars. Yeah. And uh, you know, one thing that came up again and again when I was talking to these uh, various mentors in different fields is the idea that sometime you, you, sometimes you need life to save you from what you want hmm. to give you what you need. So sometimes losing that account, oh, you look back five years later best. and you're like, best thing that ever happened. The best. Tim, yeah. you get to ask the question of the day. All the guests on the show get to ask the question of the day. It's a right. great opportunity for you to get thousands of answers on yeah. Facebook and YouTube. I know you like to get uh, consumer insights and things of that nature. Oh, Anything or favorite color, I could care less. Wherever you want to go, Timmy, fire it away. All right. Timothy. Timothy. Camera one? Is that where I'm looking? Where, I think that All one right. actually, right? Yep. This one? All right. Uh, question of the day is, what failure or disaster, or so it seemed at the time, actually was a blessing in disguise and set you up for later success. 
I love it. Tim, you said something earlier about, um, you know, you've got to be right mm-hmm. to be able to, you know, do the right thing by others. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was interesting, and you know this, this is a, we have, we have a, an interesting, great, long relationship, but I really wanted to use this medium to publicly apologize to you. This is something I've done to you personally a lot of times. Yeah. I am so thankful for the life that I live. I am such a happy man because I really like have crazy good intent and have been able to execute it a bunch. Um, this is something nobody knows here. I'm excited for everybody. I'm Tyler and people that know who I am and you, I know you know who I am. But I wanted to do it because I thought it was important for me because I want you to know how much it means to me because I've done it a bunch of times personally. Mm-hmm. Early in my career, I was giving a speech at uh, Blogs with Balls, which is <laughs> funny in itself. <laughs> and I, I think I got overzealous. I, I did get overzealous, and I was talking about hard work mm-hmm. and hustle. And in it, I said, fuck four hour work weeks, you gotta work your ass off. And the level of intent was extremely low. Mm-hmm. Um, but in reality, it was just not the right thing to do, especially because out of all the people I know on earth, the thought that I haven't offended or hurt or even did anything slightly wrong to millions of people that I have no respect for or compassion for or, or desire for friendship or how I feel about them, the thought that that happened. And um, I just want you to know, because I know I've said it a bunch of times you know, privately, but in, in my everlasting quest to, for you to know how deeply I'm hurt that I could have done anything that hurt you or miffed you in any certain way, I wanted to put it super out there into the universe and never let there be any confusion. I admire you tremendously. I've really enjoyed our friendship through the years. And that is, when I do die, that is something that will still run through my mind. I've, I've lived it pretty good. I've yeah. lived it pretty good and have all the right intents. I hated that that happened. I hate that that happened, and I want you to know on this big of a stage, or at least my little micro big stage, uh, that I mean it with every ounce of my soul. Thank you, Gary. Accepted. I know you do. We've 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 talked about it. Pers- <laughs> we've talked about it personally. So, but it mean, I, I, you mean it, a lot no, to me, man. Lot, so like, honestly, you. like now that like yeah. as I continue to get older, there's not that many people doing it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Totally. You know the 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 level of I get put into a lot of. Were, a, a lot of people use my name and associate it with other names, and I have no interest. Yeah. But every time people are like, oh, and you know, when, on Twitter or in real life, when people are like, oh, I like Tim and Gary, and every time I'm associated with your name, it means a lot to me. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome, brother. Yeah, man. I love you. Many Good adventures ahead. 100%. Yeah. Really appreciate you. Tim Ferriss, everyone. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them. <laughs>